uh, present now. And if I do it wrong, I might jump out. I'm going to hopefully do it right here. I'm sharing my screen. Share. And now I'm going to make my screen hopefully a little more interesting. And OK, does that work? Somebody give me a report. Do you see a slide? Uh, that works. Good job. OK, I feel so proud. Uh, just to be a little on a light note here, I have uh, had struggles with my computer. And I had to get new windows and everything. And so uh, in the midst of also pre preparing this presentation, I've had uh, some hairy things to do outside. But let's put that aside and uh, take our the mantle of our topic tonight, flattening the carbon curve, curve living into a renewable normal. And uh, just a little bit about who I am. Dan already introduced me. I, I install solar. I was out in the sun today and uh, doing some electrical work and some rooftop installation. I am an inventor. I am a lover of life and of earth and shalom. And I've been on the Sustainable Tucson board for a couple of years now. So the topics tonight, uh, just sort of in their briefest presentation, I'm gonna kind of give you a rough, rough overview, talk about uh, greenhouse gas emissions budget and the progress in switching over to renewables that will help us get closer to that budget. And uh, just a little bit of, of some specific things going on that are opportunities for us to advance in this very important work. So without further ado, um, we live in one planet, but it sometimes can feel like a lot of worlds. And um, we have a planetary home, and we can overcome the things that seem to separate us. Uh, if we don't, it makes it harder to live sustainably because the world tends to set us up to be imbalanced. And my hope is that part of living sustainably and reaching carbon goals has to do with being connected with not only other humans, but uh, other species. And uh, here's a little example of that. This is a tree that I made friends with on a trip to Colorado uh, recently. And uh, it's a conversation. The tree waved its leaves to me. And these were uh, my words um, in response to the tree's beauty. In Paris, uh, four and a half years ago, nearly all the nations of the world uh, took climate science seriously, and they committed to bold actions to limiting global temperature rise to well below two degrees, and if possible, to 1.5 Celsius, of course. At current rates, our carbon emissions budget to limit warming to 1.5 will be used up before the year 2028. And while almost nobody seems to think that fighting to limit global warming to the 1.5 degree Celsius target is sensible, there is a lesser aim that is more commonly talked about of two degrees of warming. And that means accepting losses that to me are unacceptable. Uh, for example, one sixth of insect and plant species will be extinct and Compared to that, at 1.5 degree loss, half that many, one twelfth of those species will be extinct uh, from the warming. This is from the IPCC report on 1.5 degree temperature rise. So given all of this uh, and the time frame, really this year and maybe next will seal or unseal the fates of these threatened species and uh, at least at some point of our own. Here's another image that shows where we're at on a 1.5 degree carbon curve. This is a, from an article written in 2014. And as you can see from the text, uh, in the blue there, it refers to our year of 2020. Starting mitigation in 2020 will require monumental mitigation rates. Um, and in my, it, you know, putting specific numbers on this is kind of hard, but, uh, and, and there's a lot of kind of 
hard hardness about coming to clarity and for example sustainable tucson being able to make a pronouncement about this but in my view a 20 percent per year reduction would at least give us a chance of pushing the curve out so that we would not uh immediately uh at that at that year 2028 be out of the possibility of um, saving some of those species and of course preventing so many other kinds of harms um i do want to to put a perspective on what a 20 percent reduction means uh in this year of covid 19 in the peak of of uh, stay-at-home orders it is estimated that carbon reductions went down to about 17 percent below normal so that's if, if you're talking about a 20 percent reduction in a year if we were to sustain what we did in April, that's approximately one year's reduction. Now it's estimated that this year, uh, that's not gonna be the average. We're going to uh, be reducing our, our emissions, but in the order of four to 7%, depending on how things go with um, uh, continued appropriate actions under the uh, coronavirus. So with that, now I want to move on to energy. Wait, and you wanna I, I'm sorry to, to pause you, but you probably need to present again. Just hit present. Yeah. We, your slide dropped off. Huh. Well, I'm going to stop sharing. And present now your entire screen. Thank you for correcting me. Let's see if this works again. Does yep. that work? We're Excellent. Back. Thank, yep. you. Thank you. All right. So um, there's a project called the Solutions Project, and this, this was born in about 2011, nine years ago, by uh, Mark Jacobson and some others. And um, their, uh, their task was to map out a path to 100% renewable energy for each of the 50 states of the United States. So they did things like this. Uh, this is a little bit simplified so that I could kind of get it on the screen. But the idea is that these divisions of percents, 10.6% rooftop PV, 32% solar PV plants, that would be utility scale solar. And uh, this CSP means concentrated solar, which heats a liquid um, to produce energy. Uh, that, if you look at those three solar, they add up to, I believe it's 73% of the total mix for our state. And wind, hydro, and geothermal, a tiny geothermal contribution making up the rest. Um, this uh, CSP, there are some plants of concentrated solar in Arizona. There have been some problems with them because there's a little bit more moving parts and hot liquids and things that tend to corrode. Um, and if that does not work out well, one thing that concentrated solar does well, I should say, is to meet evening peaks because it heats salt and melts salt so that that then that heat then can be used to generate the evening peak usage that is uh, tends to tends to be our pattern in this state. So let's see then, uh, this is sort of the prescription from 2011. And this next slide, I just add a few things. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is what we were what we're aiming for and this is what we have achieved so of that rooftop we have two percent of our usage covering covered by rooftop uh, and that would take five times the amount we have to reach that goal so that's kind of the number system i'm using here four percent is uh what we're, what's being covered currently by utility scale solar so that's a uh, one eighth of what was projected as being needed for 100 percent and uh uh, for concentrated solar, we have 50 times, where, where that's not far less developed. Uh, in wind, similarly, we're behind, but that's going to be improved a lot this year as TEP is investing in wind generation in the eastern part of our state and New Mexico to bring that in here from windier areas. Uh, geothermal is a bit uh, not very uh, relevant here. And hydro, surprisingly, is actually providing nearly as much as solar is. Solar is at about 7%, and uh, hydro is going to stay there at best. It's not going to be growing. Probably, if anything, it might be shrinking because there's just limited water around here. 
All right. So this um, this is the integrated resource plan. The, the picture on the left is just the cover of it. This is just out. You can see the date, June 26. And uh, I took this graph from that report to show what TEP thinks they're able to do uh, in carbon reductions up until the year 2035. Uh, the target, the year that kind of they use for defining what percent below we want to get is 2005. I believe that's, a, that's kind of a common a year for reference that was uh, made in the Paris Agreement. So TEP plans to be able to get to that 50% of that level by the year 2024 and to 80% uh, reductions in CO2 by 2035. Um, and that should be noted in their plan, there's, it's, it's, it's really more progressive in the sense than prior plans have been. And perhaps the uh, Phoenix Utilities Plan, APS, uh, is even a more stark turnaround from their uh, habitual uh, dragging, feet, feet dragging and solar resisting. Um, so there is a lot of encouragement at that level, which is of course essential if we're going to make progress. And I also just wanna put in a plug here and say that um, one of the things that TEP did this year, in addition to getting a, a, a reference group of people to help them form their integrated resource plan, they also included in the plan a, a study, a climate study, a climate effects study, uh, where three professors from the U of A analyzed uh, what different portfolio uh, looking ahead options for TEP would have, what the effects they would be on having the climate, uh, excuse me, on, on, on the climate. So it's worth knowing that they're putting in that effort and, uh, and it, it, it's an improvement. Uh, it doesn't get us where we need to go for a 1.5 degree rise or even really a two degree limit on temperature rise, but uh, it's a step, a very strong step in a good direction. All right, this is a very busy slide that I hesitated putting in. You don't need to know all the details of what each color is, um, but I have kind of summarized it with my big words in the middle here, energy, uh, that's electric generation, generally speaking. And transportation is a sum of these colors in here, black through light blue, and then industry and materials here below. So this is a projection from the IEA, that's the uh, energy, I'm sorry, it's the US government energy agency, if I'm, I think I'm right about that, I hope I am. In any case, it, it projects from 2011 to 2050. And so their projections of what will be possible and uh, healthy uh, show a very vast drop in energy by 2050, perhaps even sharper than uh, TEP has uh, showed that they can do. And you see part of the reason why is that these cement production, steel, aluminum, and so on, and transportation are going to have a harder time shrinking from current levels uh, just because of the nature of those forms of using energy. All right. And Dwayne, I yes. didn't mean to interrupt, but before you go on, there was a question about uh, TEP's plan. Do you know if the emissions reduction included nuclear or not? And how about APSs? They, they of course, have the um, Palo Verde nuclear plant. That's a question I wish I could answer, and I don't. I'm pretty sure that uh, APS is not, not going to give up on nuclear. Uh, and I don't know that TEP has usage of nuclear in the mix here. Maybe somebody could answer that, but I think it's at least it's a lot less, if not none, compared to APS territory. Yeah, I think, I think they do buy some now, but I don't know what their plan is for the mix because I haven't looked at that. Okay. All right. So uh, after that info heavy section, I want to just step back a little bit and remind us where we are. And uh, I, I, I know it's a little bit poor taste, perhaps, because a lot of people are suffering greatly under COVID, either with sickness or um, people they know being sick. Um, and I don't mean to... Um, be offensive in that way. But I do think that 
we can learn from the situation from what we, for example, from that 17% drop in uh, carbon emissions that were a byproduct of the epidemic, um, we can start to transfer some of the patterns that we've learned about what it means to protect each other uh, to this other realm uh, where obviously a lot of protective action is needed. So I've just made a little bit of a, a, a play game here, kind of a, put our minds in that space where the things we've learned under COVID, we can, we can apply that to uh, our carbon needs. And we've socially distanced, we can carbon distance. We make a mask, we can conserve energy. We wear a mask, we actually uh, put uh, renewable energy into our use and available for others. We wash our hands more often. We uh, turn our usage from direct fossil fuel to electric, which at least as uh, the utility plans continue and as our uh, private efforts to use solar uh, develop, that electric energy is gonna become cleaner and cleaner. Uh, and we get a test when we feel symptoms that might be uh, a, the epidemic. We invest, yes, it rhymes, that's about the extent of the comparison there. Anyway, um, uh, just a little bit of, of lightness there. So, but while we're here, let me invite you to um, consider some of the things on this order that you have done, uh, and it may not be in the context of COVID, but just over the years, some of the steps you have taken in, in these uh, carbon safe habits over the year and recognize that that has a real value. You are contributing to us meeting the goal of the, of the best humanity can do in uh, preventing damage from carbon. So take a minute here and just uh, share that with others, if you will, in the chat and, and enjoy seeing what other people put in there, uh, things that they've done and recognize that you too are a, um, you are an actor in this drama and you have the, the things that the choices you make have value and are, and are worth remembering how, that, they, that they do and that you are a good person when you do them. All right, uh, back to charts and numbers and graphs. Um, the, the objective of this section is really to show uh, kind of how solar interacts with our current patterns of energy use. So I called my friend, uh, Joe Salkowski at TEP, emailed him and asked him for a graph that would show uh, what is the month by month use of electricity in TEP territory. And so he sent me this and then I added the little circle here that's from the uh, integrated resource plan of TEP to give you an idea month to month, uh, not only how much energy they have to make but who's using it. So the green here is industrial and on the circle that comprises, I believe both mining and industrial. And the red in the middle is commercial businesses. And we at home tonight are the blue. So we're here in July and July and August are by far our peak months out of the year. And uh, just kind of get used to that shape. And then I'm gonna put another shape up here uh, this is solar production in Arizona, and this is just from a representative year, 2017, because uh, that's the graph I found. And uh, it's got a little different shape. And if we, uh, you'll notice, so what is this here? We got April, May, June. We got really high numbers of production, April, May, June. And then suddenly July comes and we have monsoons. <laughs> the clouds get in the way. And the heat also takes away some of the percentage of production because heat and photovoltaics are a little bit at cross purposes. So uh, now let's put those together. So first of all, I wanna say, yeah, this is, don't look at these as, um, they're not in relation to one another quantitatively. I just wanna get across here to contrast the peaks between the spring solar production peak where we get a lot and we don't use as much. And then comes summer when we're using a lot and our production actually goes down a bit. And uh, that's just a sad reality, but it's not hopeless. There are things that, that we can do 
to make the best of things. And I would also add, uh, if people stop using gas to heat, which is fairly reasonable to do in Arizona, if not perhaps in Minnesota, um, then the, our winter usage might also increase. And you can see then we'd have a, a, an even harder gap to meet. But on the other hand, uh, the cold is good for, for uh, production. And if you aim your modules correctly, you can up your winter production. It's just usually not prioritized because the summer peak is what we're trying to meet, generally speaking. All right. Um, this is kind of a new thing to some people. Does anybody know? I, I guess I should. I, I, I can't ask you if you know what this is because it's labeled. But this, this shows the a graph of what you get if you have a Tesla Powerwall and you get this app. Uh, and it shows you your solar production, that golden dome. It shows you what your usage is through the night, a uh, little refrigerator coming on and off, uh, water heater coming on for a bit. We have an electric water heater. And then the sun comes up and all of that energy spent by the battery uh, taking care of your electric needs at night starts to uh, get recharged. The, the Tesla Powerwall is becoming recharged. And by about 10, 15, it's full again on this uh, late spring, early summer day. Air conditioning starts up there and the extra solar gets sent to the grid to be used by your neighbors. And then I get home from a day's work and I cook and I turn on my computer and air conditioning goes up because it's still getting hotter at 4.30 or it's about at its peak. It's soaking into the house. Anyway, so this, this time here, we looked at like monthly peaks earlier. Now we can think about hourly peaks. Um, this time from about four to eight or so, somewhere in there, is when TEP has its usage peaks, especially in the summer, of course. And unfortunately, the sun is going down at that hour, which is partly why they have, they have the peak then, um, because there is enough solar on the system to make the two, two, two o'clock to four o'clock zone not, not nearly as much of a problem, of course, for them. All right, so just to get an idea. Now, let's look at another example. Uh, this is a similar part of the year. And wow, all of a sudden we're able to make good use of that solar energy uh, during the day. There's a little break where we didn't and did there. Does anybody have an idea what this usage might represent where you can match your, uh, your consumption to the solar production? Go ahead and unmute if you have an idea. I would guess that you're storing energy in your car's battery. You're right, Stuart, you got it. So, and I even adjust the charging rate according to what the solar can give if I'm at home and have the, <laughs> the tension to give it, to adjust the rate. And I would like to have that be automated and I think that's on its way. But uh, yes, you are right. Um, let's go ahead here, all right. Um, so this leads to three joyful climate mitigation practices. And I've just kind of put them in, uh, in three broad categories of solar and uh, storage and transport, meaning using en electric energy, uh, solar renewable energy for uh, transport and taking action for policy is sort of this third category. Um, There's a lot of things, whoops. Oh, excuse me. All right, for solar, you can get ahead by setting a goal. Obviously, a lot of people can't put solar on their house uh, right when they would like to. It's an expensive proposition, but it tends to pay for itself within uh, a period of about 10 years. Um, so it takes budgeting and planning, and then of course, investing. And um, decarbonizing can be a part of the goal of that uh, and a reorientation. I think, I think it's sort of a natural, maybe um, Mohyuddin or, or others who have solar here could speak to, uh, once you get solar, you start to reorient and think about 
the 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 way that you use renewable energy. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, Mohideen, if you don't want to, but if you if you would like to share anything in that, please uh, feel free to chime in. Um, and uh, some of the ways that you can do that reorientation are you suddenly say, well, look at all this extra solar energy I have during the middle of the day. I could charge an EV. I could get an e-bike and uh, ride, ride on the sun, ride on solar energy. Uh, did you want to say something, Mohideen? Well, I'm not sure what your question is, but uh, it seems to me that is uh, we we have now like about uh, 10 kilowatt system and we just added three Tesla batteries that can store uh, 40 kilowatts. Uh, one thing that you really uh, uh, as you said, it was it is expensive at the beginning, but it's really in the long run, it's really very very. Uh, the first seven kilowatts that system that that we had paid for itself in six years, and the uh, next uh, three kilowatt system uh, addition. Uh, paid for itself in about uh, three or four years. So wow. w so it's really been very, uh, very good for us. Uh, the Tesla power, you know, batteries, it was more that we wanted to, to try it out, but it doesn't really give us any more power. Uh, but it's a good investment in that, uh, we never worry about, you know, uh, uh, electricity. Uh, we don't even notice it, although it doesn't happen uh, often in Tucson that you have uh, an, outage. Uh, an outage, but we don't even, it's so, uh, you know, built in that uh, uh, it's really, so in general, that is, uh, you know, when I look about all these, thousands and thousands of pounds of carbon that we that we uh, really uh, uh, reduce from uh, our environment. It gives you a very good feeling, but it's not only that it is really uh, economical. That is, it's, uh, we, we really have free power now, so. Uh, I don't know what your question was. <laughs> uh, I think that I appreciate your sharing. That's that was very, very good. Yeah, it's really, yeah. it's really good. Okay. Um, so yeah. Um, let's go on to a little bit of envisioning. Um, Sometimes it doesn't have to be thousands of dollars on a solar system. It can be a way of doing things around the house that you figure out because you want to act responsibly. So one of the things that we did it here at home, we put a little four gallon water heater under our kitchen sink and uh, it's electric, so it's powered by our solar. And uh, we use a, that hot water is instantly arriving there as soon as you turn it on because it's right there. And so with this much water, I can wash a load of dishes so that also reduces our carbon impact because 40% of Southern Arizona's energy use is devoted to pumping water, pumping cap water our way. And so to save water is also to save energy. Uh, this is another example of uh, a, a, not just a household, but also not a, Ten or twenty thousand dollar investment in in something or in, in an energy infrastructure for your house that people can do. So community choice energy is uh, something that about ten states, I believe, have policies that allow cities and counties to be the people who choose and broker energy uh, deals for their jurisdictions for their county residents, for their city residents. And uh, it doesn't lock, 
uh, utility customers into that, but it becomes the default. So most people tend to do it. And because it's not an investor owned utility, uh, which was required to give an 11% return on investment to their foreign owners, um, it allows more of those resources to be invested in further development of renewable energy. And uh, this is an option that some of us here in Arizona think would be a good contribution, even in the state you know, where our, our big utilities are talking a good talk and they're walking part of a good walk. As I mentioned, it's not enough. So we cannot, uh, in a climate emergency, count on um, these big institutions to pull all of the weight. We have the opportunity to do our part and to get our cities together and express our opinions that this is a route that we would like our, our elected officials to take on our behalf. So, um, and I, I might stop there and just ask Shelly, um, do you have an update for us or was there, I understand that there was a chance that the Corporation Commission, the Arizona Corporation Commission, which regulates utilities in our state, uh, did they have a conversation that uh, had anything to do with this today? Um, you know, today, the last item on a very long agenda of about 25 items was about the renewable energy standard and energy efficiency. Um, tomorrow, there's supposed to be a staff meeting in which we're going to discuss uh, retail competition. This is a docket that's open in which um, maybe everybody knows this already, but which the you know, commission is looking at basically um, opening up the market, you know, it's opening up the monopolies of, of the utilities that they regulate and allowing people to have a choice of who they're going to get their electricity from. And so community choice energy is part of that docket. It's, it's a wholesale model. It's not a retail model. So, um, you know, we're working on actually presenting them with another option, another rule to review. And uh, so tomorrow, uh, that's, they're, they're talking about launching a pilot. Wayne and I were talking last night about how, to, how do you launch a, an <laughs> electric retail competition pilot. I'm not sure how you do that. You get, you know, some people to, I guess, participate. But anyway, so that's, that's the discussion that's supposed to happen tomorrow. And so, um, but this is, you know, this is a wholesale model. So it really would give cities like Tucson, the opportunity to buy their own energy at the wholesale market. And uh, the utilities, you know, TEP would still provide all the other services. They just wouldn't provide the energy, but they would, you know, transmit it. They would bill you. They would service it. You know, if there's an outage, all of the things they do except the generation part. That would be up to Tucson. And um, however, you know, however, there's, there's different models for uh, CCEs. Some cities, you know, join together and form a joint powers uh, association. Some counties form their own CCEs. You know, California has a number of these and they've done very well. It's very successful. And, um, so, yeah, just to clarify that, yes, it's uh, the generation part. It's the procurement of the generation. Um, uh, some utilities own the, gener the electrical generation facilities. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's increasingly happening that those are privately held outside of the utility That's right. and the utility or the energy provider procures the power from a given uh, source. And that would be the role that uh, Community Choice Energy would have in a city like Tucson, um, where, yes, this could, this could happen. And, it, and it's, it's, it, it can be a little bit of a tricky thing to manage the relationship between the CCE and the utility, but in a lot of cases, it can be uh, a win-win for all parties involved. So um, and there's gonna be a, a, a little more, an action opportunity that I want you, some of you to think about that for that. It involves writing to the Corporation Commission, and there's a website with information that will help you to do that. Uh, that's going to be on the last slide. So um, think about if that might be something that you could contribute to. Okay, um, great. And yes. Wayne, I, I do have a, a question about uh, trying to clarify this a little bit. Uh, I watched the um, 
documentary 2040 recently, which is, I think, still available for streaming from the loft, if you'd like to check that out. Um, one of the things they talk about there, of course, was the widespread deployment of microgrids in Africa. Now, CCE is not microgrids, right? We're talking about this is utility scale generation that they're buying elsewhere and distributing to a Correct. community. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, microgrids uh, actually has something to do with my very next slide. So you, you un, unbeknownst to you, you were my transition there. Um, this is a, a, a vision for a microgrid. Um, uh, this is an unnamed site in Tucson, and there happen to be uh, residences, and there is a nonprofit that uh, does some house repair, and there's weekend usage of energy. And if all of these associated properties that are actually owned by one owner could be uh, connected together electrically and have one utility connection and account, then that would constitute a microgrid. So then uh, you would see more solar. There's already solar on one of these buildings and there would be more solar and battery storage and the goal might not necessarily be to reach 100% usage from uh, co-located production of solar with batteries and whatever, but it might be 80% or it might be 90% depending on the resources that they choose to have. So um, this is just one kind of more uh, option that's there. And one of the real benefits of this is that it democratizes, it puts these, um, kind of, you, it forces you to look at what does it mean to go to 100% renewable um, and how much more, like you might have to produce 200% of your annual usage to get 90% of your peak usage in July and August, uh, just as an example, or 90, well, you can do better than that, but uh, it, it's, it's not as simple as uh, coming and going in equal amounts, and it doesn't matter what time during the year or the day that the production and usage happens. So it gives you then this uh, sense of, you can not only build this kind of infrastructure, you can build a life that fits with your goal of becoming renewable. And you start to pay attention to what does nature do this part of the year and how can we adjust to that so that we can live well in our desert environment and with the resources that it provides and not just say, I want it now and I'm going to get it now. <laughs> I think that's, uh, that's a note that I will end on as a part of our, our challenge and our opportunity as we uh, aim for um, really rapidly reducing our carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. Dwayne? Yes. Uh is a microgrid um, have to be uh, physically connected through a, its own uh, distribution system, or can you contract with TEP to use their um, uh, their trans or local transmission lines? It's an excellent question, and the brief answer is. There are utility companies in the United States and there are jurisdictions where you can do what might be called virtual net metering, where you can have a relationship with some solar production that's not on your property. And basically it acts as if it were on your property and you'll get billed accordingly. In TEP territory, that is currently not an option. Um, let me give you another example of though what is happening in Germany. Uh, you, some of you may have heard of the, the company Son Sonnen, S-O-N-N-E-N. They make uh, batteries and uh, there's something called Sonnen Community in Germany where uh, anywhere in the country you can buy electricity from somebody way up there, <laughs> way down there where there's wind generation or solar and you've got clouds and uh, the, the grid has been configured, if you will, to allow that to happen. It's a direct uh, um, relationship 
where even even maybe another step or two from beyond what you're requesting and it, it is it is a very good question because to build a microgrid in a place like this where the distances are several hundred feet uh that that additional length means bigger wires and more resources to make that physically happen and it would be nice if you could just say well i'm going to put it out through this distribution wire and it's going to come around the block and go over here instead of having to put that wire in so uh yes i think these are the kinds of things that we can think about and uh and propose in regulatory conversations does that mean that they're uh having distributed um storage and you buy from the grid or how that how the the sonin work it can be from storage it could be from renewable generation that somebody has it could be whatever but but there's actually this thing where the two meters wherever they are have uh, are, are are connected correlated I, I don't know the logistics and the the um, techni technical aspects of how that's done but it is an operating uh, thing right now in Germany. Um, I think that, well, let's see. So I'm gonna leave this last slide up. It's got a couple resources I'll just mention. Here's my email if anybody wants to get in contact with me. Um, this is the website that is recently up that uh, Shelley has taken a lot of initiative in putting together and uh, I have tried to support that effort as well. Um, and I did also put a link here since we're in Tucson to uh, TEP's uh, integrated resource plan. I wish you could just copy that. I'm not sure if it works, probably doesn't work for you and it's such a long thing, but basically you can go to TEP.com and do a search for integrated resource plan 2020 and you'll find it. Uh, and I encourage you geeks out there uh, to do that because uh, we need to encourage this kind of thinking that uh, TEP has put into the current plan. More of it. And I think with that, uh, Dan, if you'd like to take back and uh, we can open this up to questions uh, or whatever's next. Uh, yeah, actually it's just questions and whatever you'd like to share. So uh, if you, um, you can either stop sharing your screen uh, so everyone else can. I'll go ahead and unpin All you. Right, I'll, I'll leave this up for a few minutes in case anybody wants to get that info, and then I'll take it down a little after a little bit. Sounds good. I will at least unpin you so other people can okay. share their camera. Okay. Dwayne, here's a question. One of the major concerns we have is energy security. And as long as we're tied into one grid, if that grid fails, then we are all in hot water. And uh, what, what steps do you recommend that we take individually as a city, as, as a larger community to make ourselves resilient against that kind of disruption, which could be fatal for um, some of our population? Well, I think there are, are actually several, I mean, what bring, what, what your question brings to mind, I'm not sure, it brings to mind some of the conversations that are around regarding uh, potential uh, invasion into the cyber world and uh, messing up. Usually it's pictured from some foreign country, the people that we love to hate, uh, planning these kinds of things. Is that what you're referring to or are you just in generally talking about the vulnerability of these large systems uh, to it, whatever? It's both. Yeah, we had, we had a power outage, it lasted yeah. for a few hours in our neighborhood. There was a bank a couple of years ago where the power's out for about four hours in the summer and it was really rugged for them. So it could um, be by cyber intent, it could be by just stress on physical infrastructure. Um, well, certainly uh, there's something to be said for uh, the, the one, one of the value streams of an investment in renewable energy is that uh, depending, if you configure things correctly, you can provide for yourself from the resources and the power plant that you have on site. Uh, there are some limitations to that with just solar energy because 
of safety issues that don't allow a lot of common solar systems to operate during a grid outage. Uh, there are some exceptions to that that they do allow. They, they are they can operate, but um, uh, resilience is important and um, living within our carbon limits may or may not, uh, how would you say, uh, dovetail with that. Um, I think part of the vision in my head is that we are over-reliant on wastefulness. And I don't know what it means to get down to the kinds of emissions that, that would not ruin our future. Um, but I believe that putting ourselves closer to what nature provides and what does not require us to um, be unsustainable, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I might be taking that in a different direction than you intended, but um, if you have an answer to your question, please go ahead or, or a follow-up. I, I don't. I think where you're going with yet the last idea is that the more mindful we are in our use of resources, the less strain we're going to be putting on our systems. And that, that certainly um, is, yeah. is, is helpful. Yeah. I, I wonder um, whether Paul Durham has any comments on this, just because I imagine you have some contact with TEP and you know about their security plans, or is, or is that not in your bailiwick? I don't know if uh, Paul has any comments on this. I look forward to hearing them. But a related topic is our water supply. Uh, we get it from a long ways away, and it's mostly electrically powered. But we've got over 300 uh, water pumps scattered around the city. If we were to work with TEP and persuade them to uh, make their next electrical upgrade be solar specifically designated for water pumping, that might be a really important thing to do because then we, if if we could guarantee water, that would be a major step towards our resilience. Of course, then you're talking about probably bringing on the pumps when you have a long-term outage, which, I mean, we'd have a lot more problems if we had the long-term outage. And also, if we're powering those pumps in the city, those currently aren't running. So then you'd be pumping groundwater that we're leaving in the ground right now. So that would be depleting the aquifer, which has its own issues. So yeah, there, there's no easy trade-offs. It does bring up a lot of issues, but, um, and if the power stays off for months, we, <laughs> we're gonna have a lot of problems. Uh, but the, as far as, using groundwater, um, I do not accept that CAP, CAP is a reliable source. I had the opportunity uh, early in the year to both uh, interview the head modeler, modeler for CAP and uh, Brad Yildal, who is one of the main climatologists in the region and he and uh, Jonathan Overpeck produce a report of, uh, in the end of 2017 that's predicting that we're going to have a 20% average reduction in the Colorado River flow by mid-century. And, and if that happens, uh, both the CAP modeler and uh, Brad, you would all say those p 
projections between what CAP is predicting and what Yieldall and OPERPEC are predicting are completely inconsistent with one another. They cannot be re reconciled. So I don't believe that we should count on uh, CAP as a reliable uh, water supply. We may get it periodically, but I don't believe that we should count on it as reliable. So uh, having a, a solar power backup for being able to access our groundwater is critical to making sure we have water. Well, I mean, I would think if we had power, and we're getting off topic here because we're kind of talking more about power, but uh, yeah, you know, while we're there, I mean, I don't think anyone, including Tucson Water, actually is planning on um, this Colorado River water being a reliable source of water. We all know there's going to be less and less of it uh, with the projections of mega droughts and et cetera for the future. Um, so yeah, that, that's another discussion for another day, perhaps uh, next month. So um, it is a, a good good point to bring up, but uh, I, I guess the thing is we could, and well, Dwayne, I guess I'll, I'll ask that question also. Paul was trying to ans answer your question and he couldn't unmute himself. And so I don't know why he's having trouble unmuting, um, but uh, he was trying to answer your question. And he did request your slides, by the way, as well. Uh, I but, I guess, <laughs> but I guess to, to um, the point that Trace was making, Dwayne, does um, what sense does it make to have like, you know, distributed solar installations on each of the pump stations throughout Tucson? I'm guessing that that would be, since the city owns the water utility, that would be an investment that the city would have to make in their own infrastructure. And it would certainly be one that we could advocate for as, as uh, residents of the city. Uh, and I don't know the ins and outs of what current practices and current energy use uh, for that is, but I, I think it sounds like, Trace, you may have a better idea about that, and so would have a basis for formulating a proposal related to it. There's actually a lovely field of um, uh, solar panels in the area where the water is reclaimed and reprocessed along, it's down the Santa Cruz a little ways. So I have a question for Dwayne, but also um, to Moe if he's, yes, he is still there. With the power outage that we had Saturday night that covered a lot of the city did you guys lose power or were you able to draw on your battery, your Tesla power wall and batteries to avoid having to be, be in the dark for four hours or so? We didn't even notice that. That's what I was going to say. I didn't know that there was an outage. <laughs> yeah. Me either. That is, I heard about it on the news, but that, I, I think some of our neighbors mentioned that but we didn't I, I, at all. I will say i knew that there was an outage when during the time that carol and i were out of town because my tesla app told me that there was an outage um and it was the first one since i believe november or december so uh the service at least in our neighborhood has been quite reliable Our um, Tesla water power wall makes it so that, like, it doesn't even turn the computer on and off. It just switches right over to the battery. Sounds good. It could almost make you feel like you don't have to change your lifestyle. It might be dangerous in some ways. Well, I suspect that, uh, Carol, your and Dwayne's lifestyle is fairly sustainable already, so you probably don't need to change that much. But you're right, it may encourage some people to change their lifestyle, I'm assuming. Uh, 
Okay, it's getting kind of quiet. I don't know if anyone else has any comments, uh, anything they'd like to share, questions, whatever. I, I would like to invite Danielle, if you're in a place of being able to share and if you're willing, Danielle uh, has uh, taken some leadership in the Sustainable Tucson community in an effort to make um, green infrastructure and solar practices, water responsibility and so on, a part of uh, a program that we would encourage that among faith communities and nonprofits. And uh, Danielle, are you able to uh, share just a little bit briefly about um, how that might work and, and in case somebody here might have uh, interest in, in hearing what Sustainable Tucson has to offer? Can you um, put, yeah. I put the flyer here. up? Oh, sorry, can you put the flyer up, Dwayne? I can do that. I will try to do that. Yes, just a moment. So Dwayne actually did a really good job at telling the gist of it, really. Um, but there is a committee within Sustainable Tucson, um, and it's entitled Charitable and Faith-Based Sustainability Committee. And so basically, we are reaching out to churches, places of worship, and also nonprofits to try to revamp kind of like, you know, the, this old house style um, peoples or, or I should say places of worships and nonprofits properties with green infrastructure, which would include things like rainwater harvesting or stormwater um, improve harvesting improvements, also solar. Um, and so, we are reaching out to those communities because just the sheer numbers of churches there are in Tucson, can you imagine if all of them got on board with this idea? Like that can make a big dent in um, our sustainability efforts here in town. Um, so if you happen to belong to a congregation or a nonprofit in town and would like to promote this to your congregation or nonprofit, just go ahead and contact us. And we would be more than happy to use people like Duane and our other experts that are on our committee to do a presentation for you. Um, so I think that's about it. Thank you, Danielle. Thanks, Duane. Has anyone attempted to do a, um, uh, a sort of a plan of what next steps uh, in terms of what we think should be powered uh, by solar or uh, what financing or what uh, regulatory changes or whatever uh, that we think needs to be the next steps? The answer is many, many, many people and institutions and um, universities and governments are actively in, in, in various realms of answering those questions. Right, but I'm talking about Tucson. Tucson. Mm, well, uh, there is the Energy Committee of Sierra Club, which meets regularly and focuses on particularly state policies, state level. Uh, locally to Tucson, um, there are people and institutions at the university, of course, uh, and lots of good ideas. I mean, nationally, this is the whole, and the, the, the whole utility world has been really undergoing a lot of changes in the last five to 10 years uh, of, a, of a, you know, an order of magnitude more than the decades before that. Uh, because of the renewable advances and um, a broadening of what that implies for utility service. So uh, I've tried to bring in some elements of that conversation tonight to get ourselves familiar and be able to develop that conversation here in Tucson and in our state. Um, as far as like 
a unified theory of what makes sense to do first. I would say that um, the electrification of transportation and the uh, decarbonization of our electrical generation uh, infrastructure are seen as the two biggest, certainly for our region, because uh, electricity generation and transportation are each about one third of our greenhouse gas emission contributions. And so the other remaining ones are little slices of that remaining one third that are harder to deal with. And um, that's, that's my understanding of uh, our priorities for our area. And I would also point out that um, should be either later this year or early next year that uh, Rahina Romero is going to be starting the planning for the next plan Tucson, which hopefully will inc include more sustainability goals. And that's a good place to get more of a push for electrification and the things you're talking about, Dwayne. So definitely something we need to keep an eye on and make sure that everyone who has an interest in seeing those things go into that plan uh, get involved and push the plan the direction you'd like to see that go because that's going to be essentially the guidance for the city of tucson for the next decade at least All right, we're kind of all just staring at each other. So um, I, I do I have, have, okay, go ahead. One more related uh, request. And um, if I can see your face on the screen, which would be about two thirds of us present, uh, you can raise your hand. Otherwise you could put in a chat or something. I would like to see, are there people who have come up with ideas during this evening's meeting that you anticipate acting on. And um, you don't have to share that, but I would invite you if you would like to, to share that and it might be an encouragement to others. And a second little piece of what I'm asking is, are there uh, people among us in this room who would commit to uh, writing the Arizona Corporation Commission about a matter that could be uh, community choice energy or another thing of the, uh, the renewable energy portfolio, for example, that, that they're currently working on. If so, um, you can put your word in the chat and uh, uh, or if you would like to share verbally about uh, something that has come to you from this evening, please do so now. Okay, I'll, I'll share verbally and also, yes, I'm totally on board with uh, whatever you need uh, for sending something to the Corporation Commission. But I was quite inspired by your um, electric water heaters for washing dishes and for taking a shower. Um, I've been wanting to get rid of our gas fired heater for a while now. And so um, I would love to put a heater under the sink and one closer to our shower. Because we also have the problem, I don't know if probably a lot of you also have this, it's like in the winter, I'm freezing for about the first five minutes when the water's on because it takes that long for the hot water to get from the water heater. And then in the summer, it's like, I don't need a water heater because it's the cold water is coming out at like yeah. 110 degrees. So yeah, it would be great to have that heating closer to where I'm using it and have it be electric. I would like to make a comment. Um, Robert, B you should, okay, now I can't say his name. Robert B. always suggests that um, you start phasing out your um, your gas appliances as they start breaking down and replace them um, with electric so that you're ready when you when you put in a solar um, on your roof. I think I I love our little hot water heaters. And it's fair to say that we found that unless you have a, what it, it's water conditioner. Well, the softener. It's something it's a, like that. Then 
the it there's a lot of maintenance so you kind of have to do that other step too full disclosure it wouldn't be any more than any other electric water heater but yes that's that's the nature of of tucson water mm -hmm. a lot of calcium minerals, yes i would warn everybody and robert Bulacek in included that um if you live in an old house in Tucson, you have to have already upgraded the electrical service um, in order to have, uh, Robert suggests a heat pump water heater, but anything electric, uh, water heaters are big load. And if you've got uh, a 1950s era electrical service it won't handle it that's true of a 30 or 40 gallon standard electric water heater it would not be true of a heat pump water heater and it's certainly not true of a four or six gallon unit which is plenty for two people to shower with um, those use a standard uh, 15 amp wall plug so you don't have to have any special electrical for that Okay, good to know. Dwayne, do we have plans for a follow up later this month, a kind of unconference, or is that still getting settled? My understanding is that because Sustainable Tucson has an arrangement to be a part of that and um that this topic of tonight's meeting is likely to have a bearing on that uh i don't I'll, know i'll bail you out Dwayne. <laughs> so I've, I've been uh, working on getting so we're, we're gonna have robert bulacek which Daniel just mentioned he's going to be the expert who will be available for the unconference which will kick off the Tucson for the World event, which is currently planned for the last week of July. I don't have the exact details yet because they're still being worked out, but the format will be um, a short presentation by Robert, followed by an unconference. For those of you who aren't familiar with an unconference, is it's essentially a community organized conference. So the people who go to the conference decide what they'd like to talk about and people sign up to hear them talk about whatever it is that interests them. And then that will lead into a hackathon and a demo slash call for additional support, whatever that's gonna be uh, at the end of the week. And so, yes, that is still on the books. Um, it's still being planned. Uh, please watch uh, our all the normal Sustainable Tucson channels, our webpage, Facebook page, meetup page, the newsletter to see more details on that because uh, I don't have any more details for you right now other than Robert Bulacek should be the one doing the presentation and uh, that is still planned starting Monday, the last uh, week of July. I think it would be a good thing to remind everyone present that uh, Sustainable Tucson is now a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Somebody please correct me if I say something incorrect, but I believe that's our status. And we can receive um, uh, donations that, and the, the, the tax implications of which go with 501c3. And uh, we welcome donations to meet programming needs of uh, current current programs and developing future programs. So if you have uh, interest in supporting the work of Sustainable Tucson, uh, I, I don't, I think we're so new at being a 501c3 that we don't really even have a easy way to make a donation to us yet. Because we used to pass the hat at meetings and that becomes a little hard these days. Uh, does anyone have uh, a board member have a recommendation for if should someone wish to make a donation, how they could do that? 
contact one of the board members, I would say. So you could contact me at Dan at SustainableTucson.org. You could contact Trace at Trace at SustainableTucson.org. Um, and we can figure that out. We, we will make this better in the future. But yes, you're right. We're not set up to do that yet. Maybe you can join. You need a fiscal sponsor unless you want to do your your own financial stuff like the Alliance for Global Justice, for example. And uh, then we, we are actually we are actually a five hundred one c three now. So we um, converted from the former Nest. So we actually don't we, we are our own fiscal sponsor now. So okay. it's just we haven't set those up. Uh, Sharia did put a post in the. The chat there i say i see um that you can contact sharia at sustainable tucson.org and she can take credit cards so <laughs> if, if you're ready to you know put down something on your credit card right now she can take that and i i'll put up um i'll get our mailing address if someone wants to send in a check made out now to sustainable tucson and no longer has to be made out to nest so Woohoo! Good friends, thank you for sharing this evening together. It's been really nice being with all of you. And uh, I hope it's been nice for you too. And I hope that the uh, challenges that we face in dealing with the urgent climate crisis and the need to flatten the curve can be met with our hearts energy and our human capacity to uh, mask up and <laughs> carbon distance. All right. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you, much, Dwayne. Thank you, Dwayne. Great job, Dwayne. Some people said that they like, like that thing where you compared it to COVID. Um, they thought it was very creative. Yeah, good night, everybody. Good to Thank see you. everybody. Good, good night, night, all. Love you all. Bye. Thanks for coming. Bye.